Welcome to Real Jam Radio. I'm Danny Lurie, your host, and so happy to have you with us for this episode. This is the sixth and final of the Division Capsule podcasts, and it is with the same people who did the Pacific Division last time, Kevin Pelton of ESPN and ESPN Insider, and Ben Golliver of Sports Illustrated. And the two of them have a long history with each other. They actually hosted a podcast together back in the day. So it was fun to, to go through these five teams with them, a lot on the offseason, then, of course, the season preview as well. This episode is brought to you by a new sponsor, thrilled to have with Real Jam Radio, Greats. Greats is Brooklyn's first sneaker company, really cool shoes, and so you can go to greats.com and use the promo code REALGM for 15% off at checkout. You'll hear more about them later on. And this episode runs about an hour 20. I, I think you'll really enjoy it. Thanks so much for coming on. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having me, Danny. How's it going? It's good. I mean, we're finally actually, it's weird because like it it did feel like this off season was really fast, but at the same point, this last month has really dragged for me at least. I don't know. It feels like it's flown by to me. I can't believe that the preseason is here and that we're less than two weeks from opening night. I'm ready to rock. There's been too many of these like superstar trades out of somewhat left field, just in succession, like just clean succession, like one after another. So I'm glad that we only really have like two weeks left. So probably maximum two more major trades before the season starts. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> KP has his has his modeling fingers ready to, to handle the next trade that comes in. I don't. Please don't make any star trades again, NBA teams, especially not while I'm trying to eat brunch while I'm on on vacation, like the Carmelo Anthony trade. Well, and I was I was on a train in Iowa when the Kyrie Irving trade happened, so that that was also not great. Yeah, I should just thank all the the stars for getting traded around my vacations, not on my vacations. I wasn't stuck in the middle of some mountaintop for any of them. So, you know, knock on wood, that happens again next summer when it will probably be even crazier. Yeah. One of the divisions that was affected by those significant trades is the Pacific, which is the one that we're talking about. And I like to start these with a a basic question that in this division isn't as complicated as it was in some other ones, which is which teams got better and which teams got worse? Well, I mean, I guess actually it's an interesting question. Do we think the Warriors got better? Yeah, I do. I, I do too, for sure. I, I'm a pretty hard yes. They didn't a get hard, a, they didn't get a lot better, but so so KP is your is your thesis about the age versus slight improvement in terms of talent? Is that kind of the idea? Yeah. Also, my th- part of my theory is. What if Nick Young, what if last year was just a fluke? Because last year didn't look a lot like the rest of Nick Young's career. And uh, it, it doesn't sound like he's off to a stellar start besides, besides being, what, the only uh, warrior to make a three-pointer in the first half of their preseason opener? Yeah, it's always a bad sign when you're the new guy and you get called fat right off the bat. I mean, nobody <laughs> nobody wants that whatsoever. No, I, it's hilarious that you went straight to Nick Young, though, because we do these an- anonymous scout takes for the magazine preview. And the anonymous scout basically predicts that Nick Young is going to be the downfall of the entire Warriors. And no matter how many times <laughs> I was like, look, they could just not play him. Like if he's that bad, if he's shooting that crazy, if he's not locked in on defense, they don't really have to play him that much. And he's like, oh, no, no, this is going to be a pervasive thing. I think they're better largely through boring arguments like chemistry and continuity. You know, I mean, coming into last season, there was at least some level of questions about, you know, Durant's role. How are they going to balance it with Steph? And to me, they just hit the the ground running on all of that stuff. And when you're looking at a lot of these other teams we're mentioning, adding superstars, if it's Houston, who I think is going to actually do pretty well earlier in the season, or Oklahoma City, or, or some of these other teams that are trying to kind of piece it together, Cleveland, I think Golden State's going to be racing out of the gate. So that's sort of the basis for my argument of getting better. Danny, where are you at? I'm pretty similar to you. So last year was... I wouldn't say it was weird, but it was unusual that they were... It took them, I would say, until mid to late January to really figure it out, quote-unquote, until they kind of got the Steph Durant part right and the crunch time and that that loss, not only the one to, to Cleveland on Christmas, but the one to Memphis like two weeks later. But they were still winning a ton of games in that early part of the season because they're better than everybody else. So... I think the biggest factor is health, and last year they were pretty healthy. Durant missed 20 games. That was obviously a big thing, but they had enough of everything else. And the big health question for the Warriors is always if they're going to have multiple guys out at the same time. And that didn't happen much last year. It could happen this year because it's always a possibility. So I think they're slightly better. The other, the Nick Young part of this, I actually like, we could talk about it now, is I think there's a way to use him that 
uses some of the less catastrophic parts of him because last year, what the second unit, which I used to define when Curry is out, it gets confusing with the Warriors because they have four All Stars. They didn't really have guys that were just enthusiastic shooters in that lineup. Clay took some shots, and and so that meant that like the ball was getting in the hands of like Iguodala and sometimes Draymond, and they were taking bad shots. If Nick Young just takes all of those shots, that's actually better offensively than what they had last year from those lineups. So I guess to go back to the original question, I mean, part of the how you answer that depends on are we comparing it to the 2016-17 Warriors regular season? Are we counting it? Are we calling it compared to what they were in the playoffs? Because I think it's going to be hard for them to be much better than they were in the playoffs. (laughs) Yeah, I think it's regular season to regular season. I think that's the way to do it. All right, then I think it's a a stronger argument, although I still might take the under on 67 wins. I think I'd go over. I I was trying to make the under argument last year. Maybe I'm just feeling burned by that, or I don't know. I mean, to me... What are their flaws? What are their major flaws here? Like, even if you want to say, okay, Nick Young is going to screw things up, like, don't you just play Makai and you're probably fine. I think the biggest weakness would be if Draymond gets hurt, right? I mean, that would undermine a lot of what they're trying to do. He's been extraordinarily healthy, but I think they're also in a situation where they don't need to ride him for huge minutes or really anyone for huge minutes. I think they've kind of mastered uh, the rotation and, you know, minutes distribution side of things. I don't know. I, I really struggle to poke holes in these guys. And I, I think that's why we get to the Nick Young question. I mean, when you're analyzing maybe like the eighth most important player on a team and saying, OK, this is going to be their their issue. That's probably a sign they're pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, obviously we're splitting hairs. Yeah. Well, let, let's go. Let's let's go quickly through or we don't have to go quickly. We can take as much time as we want through the other teams. So to me, the unambiguous ones are the Kings got better the Lakers got better, and the Clippers got worse, but by less than I thought. Is there any disagreement with those? I mean, I think, again, with the Kings, it depends. Are you talking about the Kings at the end of last season or the course of last season? Because if you're asking me, you know, are they going to win more games than they did last year? I think the answer to that is probably no. Interesting. Yeah, I also don't like basically anything the Kings are doing besides De'Aaron Fox. I'm I'm in on him, but b- the rest of it, I don't really see a plan. I mean, I could see some of these guys, you know, being like pleasant surprises, like but Bogdanovich, I could see being a pleasant surprise. But in terms of like their overall direction, are they in a better spot than they were last year? I would say that's still definitely to be determined, especially when you look at like the major thrust of their offseason moves was not furthering uh, a clear youth movement. It was just sort of like picking up random scraps and throwing out uh, contracts to guys who, you know, aren't really going to be long term building blocks and, and and don't necessarily make their young guys better. So I have questions about where they're going as a franchise. Uh, to me, they're probably, you know, fourth in this division. Uh, but I agree the Clippers got slightly worse i'm real nervous about being influenced by their preseason performance because you guys probably watched that raptors game i mean it was uh you know pretty fun and it felt like kind of a best case scenario i've been suckered into early season clippers before especially last year so again i'm a little wary of of you know getting too hyped at what they look like coming out of the gate but i thought they were going to look a lot less stable without chris and they they seem to have a, a certain level of stability already you know i was ready to, to wonder are they going to be in the playoffs you know what we've seen so far suggests they will be uh and then the lakers definitely got better uh, i think there's no question about that well this was the debate that we had at lakers media day with mike trudell who uh, does the, the sideline for the lakers and also works for espn radio in la and y- you and mike were kind of on the clippers are going to fall out of the playoffs side of the equation Whereas, you know, I think that they're probably closer to sixth in the West. So I, I guess I didn't need to see I, I didn't see last night's game, but I don't need to see them in the preseason to get to where maybe you got last night. Yeah, well, part of it was the whole Blake factor. I mean, there was all sorts of weird stuff about his health, and that seems like that got put to bed fairly quickly. And they, they're they just camaraderie. You know, I was worried about that, too, because it's such a weird locker room, you know, being in person at their games, especially during that playoff run. It was just very bizarre. I mean, they just did not act like your typical NBA team. I mean, they responded weird to wins. They kind of responded weird to losses. And clearly, big culture shift with not only Chris leaving, but now Doc, you know, in kind of a new reduced role. Does that mean he's on the hot seat? I would say it does. Now, these, just a lot of things I thought that could distract from them reaching their potential ceiling, not to mention guys like Beverly, Gallinari, and Griffin always miss significant chunks of the season. I thought that left them pretty exposed to injury risks. 
I mean, talent on paper, they should absolutely be a playoff team. I'm with you on that. I was more concerned about kind of, uh, you know, tertiary factors. You know, at this point, you know, they're coming into the season, I think, with some momentum. They got to be happy about that. What concerns me about the Clippers is their defense, because last year, not the CP Beverly thing. I mean, I think Paul's a slightly better defender, but it's close like that. You know, that it's not that it's losing Luke Richard and Bob Mute, who was a really big safety net for them and not really having as many options. I mean, if Wes Johnson can actually play, that would be useful. And I think Decker has more potential defensively than well, he hasn't really shown much because he was out so much a lot last year with the back thing. But I worry a little bit that them being in the top half last year, well, it's not fool's gold, but it was so propelled by that first like month of the season when they were awesome that maybe, you know, if they're, let's say they're in the 15 to 20 range, they'll still be a good team, but it's a lot harder to, you know, you're, you're going to be in a lot more games that a team that was a little bit better defensively would just win comfortably. I mean, is it if Wes Johnson can play or if Doc Rivers will actually play Wes Johnson? Is that that's both. the way we should be framing it? It's both. It's, it's interesting. RPM actually is pretty high on their defense. It has them projected 11th in the league defensively, which is, is higher than I would go. I, I would agree. Yeah, it's it, it's hard with them. But so so back to the Kings because I didn't get to respond to that. I think the big part of it for me is there were well, there are two big elements. One is they replaced their point guard rotation goes from Darren Collison and and Ty Lawson who had both of which I would say had better years than I expected to George Hill and De'Aaron Fox. And you could say, oh yeah, George Hill's going to miss a bunch of time. Yeah, but De'Aaron Fox can be useful. Like I don't think he's going to be amazing. Most young rookies aren't, especially at point guard. But I think that's going to work well. And then the Kings are in this weird place, like Orlando is sort of like here and a couple other teams where they're not good, but they're kind of deep. They have a lot of guys. They, the Kings don't have small forwards. They have everything else. But I feel like that with Jaeger could actually work reasonably well, where it's like, yeah, if Willie Colley Stein isn't good at the start of the year, maybe they'll use Scal. Maybe they'll use Costa Kufos. You know, they have Zebo. They have all these guys. And so I, I think that's a better place to be than where, especially a lot of the bad teams in the East are, where they might have options, but all of them suck. It's two rosters in one, like an old roster and a young roster, and I don't like either one of them. I think Jaeger's definitely going to have his hands full kind of meshing them together. Uh, I would expect him to just start the season kind of defaulting to his vets as much as possible. I think their best case scenario is that the vets don't win games and then they just kind of turn the car keys over to Fox as much as possible and just let him learn on the job, kind of playing for the future. To me, he's their one young guy with like real legitimate upside. I don't see it with Papianis at all. I mean, I don't know what he's ever going to be. Scal's been super inconsistent. Uh, I kind of question whether he's going to be able to turn the corner this year. Buddy Hield, I don't know. I'm, I've am i been out on Buddy Hield, and I don't see that changing. So I don't know. To me, it could be one of these situations, you're right, where they stack up some pretty depressing and meaningless wins, and they talk themselves into you know doing something you know with their offseason moves where, hey, it looks a little bit better. Uh, maybe there's a little bit more hope than there's been there in recent years, but I don't really see what the end goal is for this franchise other than developing Fox and, and just praying he turns into a star. And to me, that's the best way to use the second half of this season is to just make him the guy. So we'll see if that's how it plays out. I mean, if they're doing anything like, you know, mounting, you know, some hopeless run at the eighth seed, I think that would be a big mistake. I mean, I, I just don't think they have the capability of doing that. I mean, how many average NBA players are there on, the, on this roster? Because I count one. One. Yeah, it's George Hill. Yeah. He's the only one. Yeah, that's and that's what I'm saying. So, who, why do we like these guys? I don't know. I mean, well, I, I just I just think they have a lot of things to throw at the. I don't like them, but I think you know I didn't particularly like them last year either. And you're and Kevin was right to just to separate out the beginning of last year, and the end of last year. Mar, I think it was Mark Spears tweeted out like his his idea of what their lineups might be, and it was basically Jaeger going old and young. And I realized that that would actually be perfect for me for selfish reasons because if they put all the young guys together. That'll be when I watch the Kings. I'll watch you know when they play Buddy and Scal and De'Aaron Fox, if they're going to play all those guys together, totally on board. If that, I would be very happy with Jaeger for my own purposes if that's what he did. And I don't think I, that group would be that much worse than their vets. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, how yeah. good are their vets? Yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, I, I think it's wrong, though, to say that Fox is their only guy with upside. I mean, I think what they have, other than, you know, maybe Heald, who's probably pretty low ceiling because of his age and skill set, his, his uh, defensive liability... 
I, I think what they have is a lot of guys who are lottery tickets. Scal certainly qualifies as that. And then we, I don't think we've mentioned Harry Giles and I, who knows how much he'll actually play this season, but he's certainly a lottery ticket too. So, you know, the, I, I guess Jackson, Cully Stein and Heald would be the kind of the, the lower, lower upside, higher downside of their young prospects. But particularly the two guys who were considered, you know, top three picks coming into their freshman season who then the Kings ended up getting later in the first round. Those two guys to me are really, really high variance prospects with a lot of upside, but also the potential to maybe never be NBA contributors. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I mean, lottery tickets, but do you believe in their ceiling? You know, I like, believe do you in, believe, I believe that ceiling, but only if he plays center, like I think that's where he can be. If he can become that stretch five, that isn't really like a true rimper to kind of like in some ways what Miles Turner might be defensively where Miles Turner's not a great rebounder. He's not a true rim protector in that way, but he blocks a bunch of shots because he can do that because he's weird and long. I, I could see Scal becoming that kind of a guy. And so what will be great though about having Scal in that role is yeah I mean generally those kind of guys aren't the centerpiece of a great team the Kings aren't probably going to be a great team for a while so you can have Scal work in that role long term and, and, and it'll it'll function you know you you want more of an all-around guy if you're going to be a playoff team I'm not worried about that with Zach uh, so the last team I saved out was the Suns and the Suns are are weird in this because I don't think they got really better from a talent perspective because they basically stayed the same and added in Josh Jackson and generally rookies even 21 or whatever old year rookies generally don't don't improve but they had a lot of like kind of you could call it pseudo worst case scenario situations last year Eric Bledsoe missing all that time due to BS tanking reasons and also you know Marquis Chris was just a tire fire out there and things like that so I think they'll be better but I'm not totally sure DNP tanking would be a great designation yeah. in the uh in the box score I mean I, to me the big thing with the Suns is the bar is set so low that even though I don't th- I still think they're probably going to be one of the couple of worst teams in the Western Conference that probably still would qualify as an improvement from you know, the season that included such dramatic uh, attempts to lose games in the second half. I mean, you would think all these guys who are between like, you know, 20 and 23 would be better this year than last year. But does that make them better as a team? I have some pretty big questions. My number one question for the Suns, though, is how does their GM get an extension based on this track record? You know, I just don't understand what their plan is. You know, there was this whole big push a couple years ago. Oh, Ryan McDonough, he's just up to stuff. He's just always in the mix trying to get guys. Maybe he's not getting LaMarcus Aldridge, but at least he's getting the meeting. And then he sits out this summer entirely, basically. And oh, yeah, and now he's just really patient and calm and he's really letting those young guys come together. Meanwhile, you look at some of their recent draft picks. I mean, good God, you know, like they have so many busts on the roster, you forget Alex Len even exists because you can't keep up. I mean, it's crazy. So I'm not in on the Suns at all. I think Booker is going to be this season what people have thought he was these last couple of years. I think he gets a little bit too much premature hype in terms of his development. I think, you know, year three for him is going to be the time where he really solidifies himself as a nice player. Uh, I feel really bad for them, honestly, because of the Brandon Knight situation, because you know, now can you trade Bletz? So I think that gets, uh, you know, trickier. And I think long term, you know, that's probably at this point, you know, he's their best asset. I'd be trying to move off him, you know, at some point. I've been saying that for two years, though they never do it. Uh, but now they're kind of stuck because what do they do if they do trade him uh, at the point guard position? Yeah, uh, I, I don't know. I would say I, think I would say they were stuck before, even when they had Brandon Knight, who of the three guys on the Suns who were in the bottom eleven in single season uh, regularized adjusted plus minus, according to Jerry Engelman's calculations last year, that would be Len, the aforementioned Marquise Chris, and then Knight had the single worst R APM of any player on the Suns, fourth worst in the NBA. But he's been a full time starting point guard who's put up numbers and like can lead a tank. You know what I mean? Now, what do they do if they trade him? You know, I don't know. I'm saying like free Tyler. Yeah, he would be their starting point guard. Tyler Ulis. Like if you're telling me we're trading Eric Bledsoe and I can have Tyler Ulis or Brandon Knight as my starting point guard. If Knight's healthy and not in a, you know, ambulance, I'm taking Knight. 
Devin Booker's getting all the shots anyway, so it, it, it doesn't matter as much in that way. But so I think what could end up being a really good thing for the Kings and the Suns is just how good the Western Conference playoff picture is. Because I could see both of those teams in the East being like, oh, we're only a few games out as the trade deadline comes in. We can, we, you know, we can be better than we've been pushing in. The West playoff picture is probably going to be so much better that they'll just be sitting there going, ah, oh, we're, we're out of it. And so then, I mean, I don't think that means a ton in terms of the Kings like trading guys, because that's more next year than this year. I think, you know, next year, either on the offseason or at the trade deadline, I think they'll move George Hill. And then with Zebo, who, who knows at this point, but with the Suns, I think they'll basically be out of it by that point. And so then that makes it a lot more palatable to trade Bledsoe. They have their own pick. They have the Heat pick, probably, unless that's a disaster. So I think they can lean into the tank pretty well. And you might as well, if you're going to tank, just trade Bledsoe. Don't keep him and do what they did last year. And so I think that that's going to be the way to go. And I've alluded to this before, and I'm working on a bigger piece, which will probably be at the Sporting News about this, but there really are not going to be that many point guards on the market next summer. It's going to be, assuming Chris Paul stays in Houston, I think it's really going to be Isaiah and then, you know, maybe some of the restricted guys. So if a team is a little bit more proactive, they can go, well, we'd rather get Bledsoe locked in now on a much more reasonable contract than any of the free agent guys that are out there. So a team could make that bet at the deadline. And I don't think Phoenix is going to be asking for the moon for him. But who is that team that really needs a point guard right now? Is it, I mean, maybe Denver, I guess? Orlando? Well, I'm I'm still on Alfred Payton Peninsula, so I... I don't know if I acknowledge that, but that that actually might be an interesting trade if you if you swap those two guys and that's Phoenix's replacement for Bledsoe, who's younger and well, well maybe not cheaper, but we'll see. And doesn't take shots, hopefully. Certainly, Devin Booker would like it. Yeah, Devin Booker would well, like it. Th- this podcast took a very depressing turn with this scenario, guys. <laughs> <laughs> As almost everything. I like in- Alfred Payton. Yeah, yeah that- Alfred Payton. I-, I I feel like it's one of those things. Well, this will be a very quick thing where everybody is kind of solidified on their feeling on him before. Like I was super low on him in the draft and just went, yep, I've been co- I like confirmation bias. I've been confirmed. I th- from what I remember, KP, you were higher on him, and you're and you're still happy with what he's done. I mean, the funny thing is I, I actually didn't like him that much in the draft. I was really? quite down on him at that point. Okay. So I am the person who's changed on him. So my theory, my theory is thrown out the window. <laughs> Very quickly, yes. Although it's a small sample size. Yeah. Uh, so let's move on. To, uh, the, the, I, I know where I want to start with this because we haven't really talked about it in the first half. And it's just like a move, a pick, a trade, a signing that stood out to you for whatever reason. And the one that we have to start with here is the Chris Paul trade. And I haven't really formally talked with either of you about this other than kind of when it happened, which is... I am very impressed, I guess that's the right word, for how much the Clippers got in that deal, especially considering the circumstances. I mean, they got more than until the Kyrie trade, any of the other All-Stars that changed team via trade, and they seem to have the least leverage. So, yeah, yeah, that worked out well. Yeah, and also with their priorities, too. You know, I think there's pretty clear, you know, indication where you have Blake in his prime, you know, DJ in his prime, potentially free agents. You know, you have a lot of pressure to win now. You've got an owner who's not interested in being a laughing stock. He's trying to chase the stadium and and keep his franchise in the mix. That's another imp- impressive aspect of the, the trade hall, too. It's just and this is a team that needed to get stuff back. This wasn't a team that was trying to play for the future or pun in, in any way. The fact that they did, yeah, it was impressive. Uh, I'm curious, Danny, I think I've talked to KP about this. How much do you like L.A.'s depth? I mean, a lot of it is made up of these parts that have come back uh, in the Chris Paul trade, whether it's Harrell or, or Decker. I mean, do you view this as a team that can go deep with quality players or no? I like them a lot in their current depth chart, but I get really worried if somebody gets hurt. So like if Gallo misses time, Decker or Wes Johnson or whoever moving up into that role, I don't love that. But as it, as it is presently constructed as a healthy team, I do really like it. And I, and their center depth is nice. Willie Reed, Montrez Harrell, I like both of those guys. And DeAndre is an Iron Man. He's the one guy I'm not worried about missing time. So you have that. So so I do like it in that narrow a sense. I'm also completely not convinced that Doc is going to use that depth properly. But at the same point, I was more freaked out about that idea until I remembered how much shot creation they have on their second unit, even if they don't stagger, 
Because if they're going to play Austin in the starting lineup and they're going to have Tay Dosich and Lou Williams on the second unit, you don't need to have Gallo or Blake Griffin out there because you already have guys that are going to generate offense. Yeah, I mean, I think the one big question in terms of staggering is kind of what they do defensively because, you know, if Austin Rivers starts and Beverly starts, Tay Dosich and Lou Williams together, <laughs> that is flammable defensively. A phenomenal offensive backcourt, but flammable defensively. There kind of seems to be this trend in the NBA, though, of just kind of like, screw it when it comes to defense. Like, more and more teams are just like, eh, whatever. We'll de- just get into shootouts de- and see what happens. On the second unit, defense is for teams that don't have offense. That's not actually what I believe, but I think that could be their operating philosophy at this point. And also remember, while they ended up using it to dump Jamal Crawford, the Clippers got a first-round pick in that trade, too. They ended up moving it. But I, I, I've been very impressed with that. And as... You guys said, Ben said this, I think, particularly well, like that it it fits in really well with what they needed. And while I wish the Clippers would have broken it down, and I think they made a big tactical mistake by doing that, and I don't think we need to talk about that in any length, I understand why they went the direction they did. And they also, you know, other than Blake, getting Gallo on a shorter term, I believe it's it's a straight three-year deal, right, KP? There is not. Yeah, it is a straight three-year deal. Yeah, that's right, because it was a signed trade, so it couldn't be. Yeah, that's right. So like that, you know, I I don't love the guy. I'm worried about, you know, I watched a lot of the Nuggets last year and I just kind of sat there and watched him not care about on defense and just went. And, you know, that was a team that could have made the playoffs and to sit there and and have that sort of an issue. But I've been a believer in his talent since his Nick days. So I'm excited to see how this all works. Well, I was going to say for the biggest moves, the most interesting moves of the summer, that Gallo signing is right up there for me with, with this division, just because uh, that feels like the X factor move, right? Like if he's healthy, he plays well, he's recommitted. Like you're saying he's back on a winner and he has a clear role. Then that could really pay nice dividends. If there's fit issues with their front court, uh, you know, if it winds up kind of, he feels like he's out of position a little bit, or if Blake misses time and now Gallo is taking a pounding that he doesn't want to take. I, I don't know. I, I can see the Gallo experiment in LA, you know, playing out in a lot of different ways. And if he happens to miss time, then that's where we start to talk about their worst case scenario. Cause I don't trust the guys behind him on a depth chart at all. Uh, and I think there's going to be a substantial drop off. Uh, between him and and whoever else they plug in there. I think they'd probably have to get to some weird three-guard lineups if he did miss time. Now they're in weird matchup situations. So uh, to me, that might be the most interesting move of of the entire division. You forgot to mention if he's not punching people in the face uh, also. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, that's a a great way to welcome yourself to a new franchise, isn't it? Well, I mean, at at least the Clippers know how to deal with that. (laughs) They they certainly do. I, I like Decker a lot more than you do. I mean, I think the one concern is that it seems like kind of all of their threes are either 2.5s in the case of Austin Rivers, who I I do think would start there, you know, if Gallo missed time. I think they'd probably want to go to like a Beverly Teo, such Austin Rivers lineup that, you know, could compensate a little better for Teo defensively. But they're either 2.5s in Austin Rivers' case or 3.5s in the case of Gallo, Sam Decker, and Wes Johnson. So there's nobody that's really like a straight three on this roster other than, I don't know, maybe Sundarius Thornwell, who we don't don't know enough yet about what his NBA position is. Yeah, I think they're going to miss Mbamute Mute a lot for that exact reason. Just having a guy. Also, they don't have a player that you can just stick on a good wing and just say, hey, defend this dude. Like Austin Rivers, that's probably going to, they'll use him. They'll use, they had Gallo on DeMar DeRozan in both of the preseason games, which was super, which was weird to me. It was surprising uh, considering Austin Rivers is, is Doc's defensive guy and son. But I, I think that that was that that was surprising to me, and I I worry a little bit about that. Though I acknowledge that that's more of a playoff concern than a regular season concern, just because there are a lot of teams that don't have a really good wing score. Yeah, what do you guys think about their playoff ceiling? I think it's pretty tough to envision them winning a series. I, th- game, I think, game six. Yeah, game six. Yeah, I think they could win a couple, and and that's if that's if they don't have the standard Clippers now, like one or two players get hurt in the first four games, that sort of a thing. But I will give the Clippers credit for this. They are one of the fun teams that got worse from a talent perspective, but completely skyrocketed their league pass ranking. And I enjoy that. I enjoy it when a team gets way more fun to watch, even sometimes if they get worse, because there are a lot of good teams around the league and. I think the Clippers are going to probably be in the top five to six teams that I watch the most just for my own enjoyment. 
I mean, Teo Dosich is basically a walking league pass alert right now. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I think yeah, Zach Lowe I, has mentioned this in the past that, you know, a lot of it is just kind of trying, watching, wanting to watch teams figure something out as opposed to no, teams that know exactly who they are and what they're doing. And last year that described the Clippers. Yeah, what I was going to say about Teo Dosich is he gets so much hype on Twitter that your natural inclination is to sort of be like, you know, part of the backlash of like, oh, he's a little overhyped. But then you watch him, you're like, no, no, he's definitely even better than advertised. This is awesome. This is well, really fun. And, and so that's the parallel I thought of last night. So I, I during the game, I tweeted that I wanted somebody to do the, like, Tay Dosich alert. And I, I realized, so basically that is a, a Twitter account that the only tweets they put out are m- saying that he's about to check in. And the last two players I said that about were exactly in the line that Ben was talking about, and that's Giannis and Embiid, where it's guys who <laughs> they, they had an overhype and people were like, oh, you know, it's not going to be that. And then they totally delivered on it. Tay Dosage is different because he's not actually an all-around basketball player, but he's so fun to watch. And what we see with him, and this could be a connection because I'm sure we're going to talk about Lonzo later because I know Ben loves talking about Lonzo Ball, is both of those guys really do energize their teammates because they see passes that other guys don't see. So you have to run the floor because you'll be rewarded a higher proportion of the time than you are playing with normal guys. I would say, by the way, that A, I want the Joe Chi uh, alert for whenever he's in the game because it's really more valuable with guys who are randomly checking in as opposed to those who are part of the regular (laughs) rotation. I, I enjoy just enjoy watching him play. Uh, and then also, B, I'm very excited. I think that Tato is just going to get name-checked on a sitcom with NBA fans in the writer's room at some point in the next year and, or year and a half. And uh, I, right now, I have You're the Worst as a slight favorite over The Good Place to supply that random Tato such reference. Uh, Zochi hit a three-pointer last night. Did you see that? I did. And he had a block and then had a, what should have been a clean block that he was called for a foul on. Man, when is he going to get the superstar calls? That's the real question. Uh, yeah, no. Should we talk Lakers? I mean, we've probably the first podcast ever to go 30 minutes about the Pacific Division without even mentioning well, the and Lakers. Where, where I want to start with the Lakers is actually a place that is not where they are right now, but the big move they made at the beginning of the offseason, deciding to basically trade D'Angelo Russell to unload Timofey Moskov's contract and get back a couple pieces, including now Rookie of the Year, potential Hall of Famer Kyle Kuzma. <laughs> Kyle Malone, is that what they, I think they were calling him on the basketball friends the other day? <laughs> yeah. Well, um, he's definitely getting his jersey retired at the Summer League. He'll be up there with Nate Robinson. There's no question. I mean, right, he's, so, so this isn't the actual question, but we were discussing this on G Chat the other day, and we should put this out in the open. What is the ranking of Lakers pow- best Lakers power forwards at this point? And where, do, where does Julius Randle fall on that list? Well, I think it's going to be a while till you get to Randall. I mean, I'm still out on Randall. I don't know about you guys. Pretty far out. I mean, well, so I feel if, like if it, if, it, if it doesn't click this year with Brooke as a stretch five and Lonzo force feeding him wide open offense, I don't think it's ever going to click for him. So, so there are two issues for me with Randall at power forward. I actually like him at center, and I think that's that's his end game is being a second unit center, and he I would really like him in that role. You know, kind of actually like a weird bad defensive version of Draymond at center in terms of role. I think that's kind of where you go with it. But yeah. as a power forward, so I mean you you have I would I would have Kuzma I'm not saying Kuzma's the best, but I would have Kuzma, Brandon Ingram, Wall Dang, and Larry Nance over him. I mean I think Larry Nance is probably their best power forward. Yeah, so Kuzma's exciting preseason aside. Well, yeah. I think here's here's the issue, though. I mean, if you're the Lakers and you're the new front office, how much do you basically how much leash do you give Randall to sort of prove prove that he's a guy or reprove that he's not the guy? Right. I mean, couldn't that be a big hang up for their season? This idea that he is somehow part of the core because he was drafted high and, you know, he's got some flashes of being really, really, really helpful. How long do you go with that before you admit defeat? I think that's kind yeah. of a fundamental you, you, question for them. It is, and I and I I'm different than where I think Polinka and Magic are going to be. I would give him one link of leash. I think that you don't you don't do that. And also, the big part of it is that if they're trying to clear two max spaces, you probably can't bring him back like that because the pragmatic thing is they. I'm sure they would probably rather shed Dang and Clarkson than Randall, but realistically, that's not going to happen. I mean, Clarkson's both Clarkson and Dang are on undesirable contracts, and so it's easier to dump one of them 
them and then just basically let let Rand, Russ, let Randall go or ideally use him as a sweetener in that trade. So I would give him less latitude and also think about that the Lakers don't really need a high usage guy like what Randall wants to be with their starters. They they have other places to make that work. And so if he wants to be on the second unit, you can do that. But remember, they have a lot of interesting second unit guys. This is kind of like Sacramento where they don't have a lot of great players, but they have a lot of guys that they should at least give a shot to. Yeah, yeah. the thing the thing with Randall and the Draymond comps, it's like, yeah, he's Draymond if Draymond didn't protect the rim, didn't do a good job of playmaking in the half court, didn't have three point range and didn't understand what shots he he shouldn't be taking. Then he's Draymond. You know, it's like mean, the- all the things that I like about Draymond. Uh, Randall's not there. And so from the standpoint of is he better as a backup five than a starting four? I agree. Is he going to be successful as a backup five? I mean, I still have like pretty legitimate questions about that. I mean, obviously, the, the expectations would be a lot less in that role. I mean, I do think stylistically, like, you know, we talked about the Lonzo effect. I mean, I do think Randall can kind of fit in that in terms of up and down and, and ball movement and getting momentum and, and, and things along those lines. So I guess I would try to run with that maybe a little bit longer than you would, Danny. But uh, I do think another argument for doing that, by the way, would be to try to get something in trade, you know, basically just start the season showcasing him uh, past that. I don't see uh, really how he's part of the core. And I also agree that like any touches he's taking with that starting group, I'd rather just be force feeding Ingram. You know what I mean? Like, let's just see what he can do. Yeah, I'm still pretty skeptical there. Okay, so 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 let's, wait, whoa, whoa, oh, whoa, whoa, yeah. whoa, whoa, let's let's hear that. Why? I mean, he he's gotten stronger, and you see the ability to create off the dribble. But is the finishing going to be there? Can he score efficiently in the NBA? Because you know, for the all the excitement about him, he hasn't done that in his first two preseason games. He certainly didn't do it last year. When, when is this going to happen? He had one awesome summer league game, KP. Come on. I know. I was there. I, <laughs> I, I, can, I enjoyed it. I can totally see Ingram, especially this year, being that guy who can do well against summer league competition, but not against NBA, you know, high level. And especially as a starter and as the probably the most dangerous offensive forward on his team, he's going to have a lot of good. This is the same issue I have with the Utah Jazz. He's going to have a lot of good defenders on him because there isn't anywhere else for those defenders to be. So like when they play the Pelicans, I they might put they might put Tony Allen on on Brandon Ingram. And while Ingram's way taller, I could see that not really being a fun time for him and all those sorts of sorts of circumstances. And so they just don't have another like they don't have another guy that draws that sort of attention. And that's really what I think they should be looking for in a fifth starter. And that's actually a question I want to ask you guys is if you had complete control over the Lakers, prioritizing whatever you want to prioritize. I assume we can pencil in Lonzo, KCP, Ingram and Brooke as four of the starters and you can play Ingram in whatever position you want. Who would you have as your fifth starter? I would probably have Larry Nance if I was trying to win games. Just because I'd be trying to get something for Randall or, you know, at least trying to do right by him, I'd probably start Randall to start the season. Uh, but then I would look at either Nance or maybe Luol Deng. I would probably go with Dang for the same logic you guys are using with Randall because the hope, the dream for, for Dang is that you can get somebody to say, oh, his contract's not that bad that he's not an albatross, that it's, you know, like it kind of like the Damari Carroll thing where it's, you know, maybe it's negative value, but it's not as much negative value as they're going. And if they could get dang to that point where it's salvageable, then this, the pathway to two max contracts opens up a little bit. Yeah, that's a good point. And that's where, you know, kind of this construction, of the Lakers roster might be problematic because as much as Luke Walton might want to play dang it power forward, he's got so many bigs. Are there, are those minutes going to be available? I kind of feel like you you have to give some of the priority there. And also, you know, they can, you can think about the Lakers season in two segments, which is if I were, if they wanted my advice, which is what I would do, which is pre pre trade deadline and then post trade deadline. So my idea would be maximize, you know, try to get everything you can out of Jordan, like get people to love Jordan Clarkson, Wal Dang and Julius Randle as much as possible for the first like two, three months of the season. And then after that, Go to the lineups that you want to do. Nance, you know, whoever of those guys stays, all Ingram at different positions. But in the early part, because they have to clear some of this money. Like, that has to be, you know, obviously job one is showcasing and, you know, seeing what you have in Alonzo and all that. But job two is lining this up so you can get two max guys. Yeah, I, I'm actually not that worried about finding minutes for guys, sort of because of what Danny's saying. Like, having gone to a lot of late season Lakers games in recent years, there is always minutes available. Like, you eventually reach a point where 
it's just so hopeless that you could throw out whoever you want to see and, and, and get them reps. I mean, there's going to be enough time for all of that. The KCP move was another interesting one, though. I mean, do you feel like this is a rental or are you seeing him more as a longer term piece? It really depends on what happens next offseason. I mean, I, I thought it was interesting, you know, watching their game the other night, how much they were bringing him off of curls and like using him in that way, which was not something that I anticipated with KCP. It, it was interesting because of the fact that it wasn't, you know, like J.J. Redick, you'd bring him off that kind of downstream four or three pointer. In KCP's case, it was for the 18 footer. They had him in late late in the game, like defensive stopper trying to like you know chase a win in the preseason. So who well, knows I, exactly I've, I've also, what's happening there? I've also been cracking up with KCP because there's this group of people that are are already committed to the KCP backlash because people like Nate and I really like KCP because he can't score. And it's like that's not what he does. You you know you can't you don't want every guy to be a Devin Booker type you know gunner. You want somebody who can actually play defense. And what I love about KCP and why he could be a long term fit if they strike out on the high guys on their list is because his ability to defend both guard positions is really I think fits in with Lonzo's defensive end game so you just play Lonzo on the on the smaller threat and then let, let, let him do whatever he wants to offensively I think that works perfectly for him and there are some of those guys that KCP included that will be on that market next year and while I think they would rather have Paul George than KCP that would be a pretty good fallback and then the underrated part of this that I want to bring up is I've been selling myself more on the idea that Brooke Lopez comes back for the room exception and then has full bird rights after that and you get sort of that the semi collusion type thing which they also could do with Tyler Ennis and I could totally see that happening because Brooke is uh, I mean he's not an LA kid but he's a California kid and you know the Lakers could be fun long term and they're going to need a center so I could see that happening more with him than KCP because it's only one year to get to get back to his full bird rights yeah that makes a lot of sense yeah, I like the defensive pairing that you're mentioning with Ball and KCP, you know, for the exact same reasons. I mean, interchangeability and, you know, save Lonzo for offense. What do you guys think Lonzo's shots are at, at rookie of the year? I mean, he's going to get minutes. He's going to get exposure. I, I think those things both work. I mean, partially it just depends how good the Philly guys are and how much they steal votes from each other. So that's interesting that you brought that up because for me, I think Lonzo, he's he's either 1A or 1B because he's going to get counting stats. And while I wish that other people controlled the voting a little bit more, I feel like that's still the way that it works. I mean, you, you can look at various circumstances and also, you know, like the way six man of the year voting goes too. So to me, the two front runners are Lonzo and Dennis Smith. Because those are the two guys that are going to get a lot of opportunities without other players in there. I mean, think about when Joel Embiid was healthy, how much the ball was in his hands last year. And there are a lot of mouths to feed in Philly. They could be a better team, and you could build that narrative. But for me, it's Lon- I would say it's probably Smith 1, Lonzo 2, but it's really close between those guys, then both of the Philly players. I think I would have Simmons a cut above Fultz and I think I would have Simmons maybe even above Smith I I could see this coming down to Lonzo versus Simmons to be honest but I think you know Lonzo the hype factor for him is you know could like you're saying the counting stats could sort of unfairly favor Lonzo I think the hype factor could too because he's just on a different plane in terms of how much he gets talked about how much media there is around him constantly and I think unfortunately that could factor in to this voting situation, you know, especially if, you know, the Lakers just mildly overachieve the buzz that they've built is a real thing. And it's crazy how far it's carried. them. You know, I mean, if it carries them all the way to the rookie a year, that would be pretty impressive. And again, I hate giving LeVar like credit for these wins, but I mean, I think that's a, a big factor here. I mean, it seems like if Philly makes a playoff run or gets in the playoffs, that could sort of counteract some of that hype because, you know, obviously it is the Lakers probably going to be playing out the string at that point. But. Well, absolutely, especially because the Sixers ended last year with such a bad record that I think a lot of people will be saying they're going that. But I, those narrative cases, you know, that's kind of more like the, to me, the Derrick Rose MVP where it's like those win out when other things don't. And it's, it's well, certainly possible. Do you guys really think that Fultz will be on that same level as Simmons? I think there's going to be a pecking order there. I think Simmons is going to have the ball more. I think he's more mature as a player. I think he's kind of a more finished playmaker. And I think it sounds like his role is going to be kind of like, quote unquote, point guard on offense. I think all of those things are going to, I mean, Fultz might pull a little bit just because he he shares the spotlight. But I think Simmons is going to be the the, the more desirable and more obvious candidate here pretty quickly. Yeah, I'd, I'd favor him over Fultz. I mean, I, part, he also has to stay healthy. It's the other aspect of this. 
Is the he in this context both of them? Because yeah, it could be, but more Simmons than faults in this case. Well, and the, the the other thing with Simmons, why I think his rookie of the year case is weaker, is just because I don't see him as a great scorer. You know, he'll get opportunity score, but also he's such an unselfish player in transition that I could see him just converting some of those points into assists, and that doesn't help him. That could hurt Lonzo too, but I think Lonzo's going to score more in the half court because unlike Simmons, he's just going to take shots. You know, like whether they go in or not, that's just the way Lonzo is. And Lonzo, you know, he when he's open and he's set, he can make a lot of those. So I'm really excited to see how that works out. Before we move on to more of the off-season review, I want to tell you a little bit about Greats. Greats is Brooklyn's first sneaker company, and their classic, stylish, comfortable sneakers sold at a great price. The ones that I got were the, they're called the Royales, and they're the Nero colorway, so they're dark dark colorway. And what I really like about them is that they're incredibly distinctive. And in sh- in shoes, you can go for a lot of different directions, but I-, I think they stand out. They look really cool and they're very comfortable. I- I've-, I've enjoyed wearing them around for the last little while. And they say you can wear them with or without socks. I'm not somebody who wears them without socks, but I will take their word for it that, that you absolutely can. They have a wide selection of men's and women's shoes, not only in terms of style, but also in terms of color and things like that. And I've, I was very impressed with their selection. And one of the other great things that I love doing, especially with our with new sponsors, is that you can check it out really for yourself. And so what you do is you go to greats.com, G-R-E-A-T-S dot com, and you enter the real GM offer code. And what you get for that is you get 15% at checkout. And they believe so much in their shoes that you get have a no risk return and exchange policy. So you, you make sure that you love what you get and that it fits well. And that I was really happy that the ones that I ordered, they fit perfectly, wearing them around now for, for about a week and have been very impressed impressed with it. Good fit, good look, and they have lots of styles. So whatever really your preference is in terms of a shoe, they have something that fits for it. So very excited to have them on the podcast. Again, greats.com, G-R-E-A-T-S.com. Men's, women's shoes, stylish, comfortable sneakers sold at a great price. And we can move on to the next question. I think we'll be faster here. Is just the, who you think is the best newcomer to their team? Uh... But I'm, I guess I'm not sure. I, I guess Gallo? I don't yeah, know. I think, it, I think it's Gallo. I think it's Gallo uh, or George Hill. And it's funny because both of them have the injury concern. So it's not like you could say, oh, well, this guy's going to play so many fewer minutes that it's going to go that direction. I think I think Gallo's a more talented guy. I think that, you know, that, that his ceiling is higher. But I do love I do love George Hill so much. Do, do Brooke Lopez and KCP deserve to be mentioned in this conversation? Absolutely, they do. Uh, I, I think I would probably have them a step below, partially also just because of the team structures that they're going into. But certainly, they, they, deserve, they deserve to be talked about here. Nick Young does not. <laughs> hey, so you mentioned that you love George Hill. Do you love the fit in Sacramento for him? Or do you like it? Or are you sort of, you know, wish it was better? Or where are you on, on his fit? I have this really outlandish theory that the guy who might end up making this work is Bogdan Bogdanovich, because Bogdanovich is actually not that bad with the ball in his hands. We'll see how it works in the NBA, but I I liked him in EuroLeague and in EuroBasket in that way. And what I like with George Hill is actually the dynamic that he had with Gordon Hayward last year when both of them were on the floor, which was not that much, which was, you know, he can be, he, I love Hill off ball and I think he can do well on ball too. He was underutilized in Indiana. But they don't really have that second option right now. Also, I, I'm openly skeptical of Sacramento's bigs other than Kufos as like real pick and roll players. And Kufos is just like set his screen and just run to the basket. It's not very complicated with him. So I want to see how that works. But I don't think it's terrible as fit. But if that season starts, if the, as soon as their season goes off the rails, it'll get bad. Yeah, how much do you like playing him with Fox? Do you like that idea at all? Mm, it's okay. I mean, I think both of them, I think Hill can defend twos periodically. So it's okay. It's not my favorite thing in the world because Fox can't shoot, but it'll be, I don't think it's disastrous. I'm a lot more skeptical than you, Ben, about how much Fox should play as a rookie because I think he is not, not, not just going to not be good. I think he is going to be bad as a rookie. Oh, I think he's going to be bad too, but I think it's it's more of a long term directional thing of like. Yeah, but do, do you start to hurt his confidence by playing him that much if he's going out there and getting his ass kicked by the and other amazing point guards in the Western Conference? Yeah, we've certainly seen cases on both sides of well, that for but, sure. But I mean, so he doesn't he, seem to lack for confidence to me though, and I think you got to give him as many minutes as he can possibly handle. I understand not starting him from day one. I do get that, but I kind of like George Hill in the driver's ed instructor role, where like he's. 
you know, at some point of the season off the ball and kind of, you know, he's there when Fox struggles and stumbles, but you're still letting Fox do a lot of learning on the job. And I go back to my you know, earlier point is just I don't see a lot else here that's super worth getting excited about or even really worth keeping long term. So whatever you can do to to speed Fox up is my number one priority for Sacramento. So, Kevin, I think that you're the theory that you're getting at is spot on. And I think the way that you answer that at the beginning of the season is just don't play him against starters as much. You can still play him close to starter minutes, but have him come in, you know, maybe the quick sub for whoever and just have him come in like the six minute mark or something like that and and play that way. And then if he shows that he can do more, then you do more. But what, what I like about Fox, having watched him a little bit in college, is that he relishes those matchups against good players. I mean, good college players and good pro players are very, very different things. But I don't think that's going to shake him as much. But you, you, that's why you have to know the circumstances on the ground if you're Dave Yeager, and you have to be ready to adapt to whether he brings it or he doesn't and how he reacts to that. Because you're right, you don't want him to get broken or, or, or weakened by the experience, like, let's say, uh, a young quarterback who comes in on the Browns or something and just gets wrecked for a year. Yep. Yeah, and it goes back to expectations, too. And I think that is a key question. Like, if this front office and ownership expects to win this year, that could really distort how a rookie, like a high-profile rookie like Fox, approaches the whole season. If they are a little bit more modest in their expectations, they're more willing to go to the young guys, you know, earlier than, maybe not opening night, but like fairly early in the season, and they're willing to absorb some losses here in kind of a transition time period, then I think that should make it easier for a player in this situation. I'm not sure I have a real clean grasp on what they think they're trying to do. If they're trying to win, I think it's going to be a, a disaster. And I would start to worry for Fox if they are communicating to him like, hey, you're our guy. We we expect you to stumble. It's going to be OK. I think that's the way to play it. Really, it's those four guys, though. I mean, Gallo, Hill, Lopez and KCP that are really in this mix. The Suns didn't add anybody that is really in the consideration. The Warriors didn't add anybody that's in consideration. So, yeah, I think that's about right. You could maybe, if you really squint hard, make a case for Lonzo belonging in this discussion, but that that's more optimistic than I am about him as a rookie. I'm trying to remember, Kevin, did your model have him as the best or the second best player in this class? Uh, the the best prospect long term, yeah, yeah by, okay. by far. But even then, like, I mean, a, a young rookie point guard is, is going to struggle. So, yeah, I mean, and and, and also with Gallo and, and Hill, like, this is the best year of these contracts for them. So I think they'll be, you know, they'll be better. Uh, Lou Williams might also deserve a shout out here. I mean, Lou yeah. Williams was as valuable as any reserve in the NBA last he season. Was, he so was he, the best he's player on the Lakers for the first half of last year. Granted, that's because the Lakers were vortex that everything good went to die, but he still was. So I'm th- still with Gallo on this. Yeah, <laughs> Gallo is yeah. Gallo's a fair pick. I, I think I think he's the best player here, um, and Hill's probably second. But so then the last question of the offseason review part, which you could say it is a season preview, is just not the rookie you think is going to be best, but the rookie who you are most excited to see in this division. So I mean, it's Lonzo. Because Lonzo is amazingly fun to watch, I, but this this division is certainly loaded with rookies who I think most all of us are excited to see. Teodosic falls into that category. We haven't talked about Josh Jackson at all yes, yet on this podcast, which is a, a little weird. But uh, I'm excited to see how his jumper translates to the NBA, and you know how much of an issue it is, but defensively as hard as he competed in summer league he was a lot of fun to watch and then the athleticism the finishes so you know i think he's going to be probably more entertaining than he is effective as a rookie so I, i'm interested at some point to see harry giles get out there and see what he can do in an nba setting in addition to fox so there's a lot of guys in this in this division i think it's clearly uh lonzo uh fox would be probably number two actually tia dosich would be number two for me then then fox but i think the jackson one's really interesting because his energy i'm not excited by the way to see his how his jumper translates i'm i close my eyes every time he loads up and that goes for basically every shot he takes besides his dunks but he does generate a pretty consistent amount of you know basket attacks that are really fun to watch and his energy also just kind of pops to me in phoenix like i feel like they have a lot of just lazy uh or just not hyper motivated maybe a little soft i mean they just just have a lot of young guys who don't fall into that like breakneck speed category and those guys bother me and injecting jackson into that environment it's like kind of perfect because it really pops every time you watch him uh sometimes for good sometimes for bad he had a pretty ugly end-to-end stretch 
uh, the other night where he was like racing down the court just to save the ball under his own basket for a layup for Portland. The kind of thing that makes you slap your head and remember that he's a rookie. Uh, but yeah, he's he's certainly on my radar uh, from this division. Uh, no question about it. We also didn't mention uh, Golden State, you know, Jordan Bell. I mean, are we just assuming no minutes for him or, or what are we thinking? No, I was going to throw a shot him out at some point here. He's yeah. definitely good. He was very exciting to watch in summer league. And then, by the way, somehow I skipped over Kyle Kuzma, who has been like him running the court with Lonzo is incredible. Well, yeah, and that's one of the things that I'm most intrigued by with this Lakers team is that a lot of the players who are the best fits to play with Lonzo are actually on the second unit. Like Kuzma, I think, is a wonderful fit. I mean, Brooke Lopez in the half court is a perfect fit, but he his running down the court still takes like a half an hour. So that's going to be a little bit of a challenge. But they, if they go with Randall at center in that spot, that could be fun. And also Larry Nance with him is going to be a blast. But the, the two guys that I wanted to bring up, which were both mentioned in this, you know, on the lower end, Lonzo, Lonzo's number one with a bullet, and, and Tato, Sitch, and Fox are probably next two. But on the flyer side, Harry Giles and Jordan Bell, two guys that I really do like. Giles, I was super high on him as a high schooler. I thought he had immense talent. We don't know if he's ever really going to be there, but I'm going to watch. I think I will watch a higher proportion of his minutes than any other rookie in this division, other than Jordan Bell, because it is basically my job. But that I'm just intrigued by what he could be. It might not be much this year. It might be maybe like an April thing. But if Giles works... Then we start to think about the Kings in a very different way. They still need all the wings in the world. But if Giles and maybe Scal and maybe Fox, if we, if we can see like one or two legit players from that group, then all of a sudden the Kings are in a different place when they don't have their pick next year. I just want to give both you and Kevin credit for doing a great job of selling hope to Kings fans. I think it's <laughs> admirable. I mean, the Scal stuff earlier, the Giles stuff here, it's phenomenal. I'm in. You're you're practically convincing me. Have we gotten a Giles update in terms of his health and, and everything? This, I mean, how's he doing in preseason? I have, I confess I haven't seen anything. So he, was, he missed their preseason opener, but uh, Justin Jackson said a few days ago that Giles, quote, looks like he's back. So there you nice. go. Nice, nice. Uh, I, I also wanted to mention Josh Hart, by the way. Oh, yeah. Good call. Overshadowed by the many other Lakers rookies. And who knows how much he'll actually play because of the depth Deep we cut. talked about earlier. But this guy was arguably the best player in college basketball last year. So, you know, he, he sh- and, and has the kind of, you know, complementary skill set that should work well in the NBA. Yeah, I mean, I actually thought Josh Hart, I liked him a lot more in college than Kuzma. Kuzma, one of the rare Pac-12 players that I absolutely just did, I didn't see it with him, but I mean, I saw the what you heard from the combine, it made sense that he looked different there, that they were just using him a little bit differently. And But you're right, I mean, and, and that's something that I really do like about the rookies in this division in particular, is that there are a lot of guys that probably won't get much of an opportunity, but I think will learn something interesting whenever they're on the floor. Hey, Danny, how do you see Bell being used like as the season develops? So the big problem there is that they got all three of their centers back. So basically, their vision for him, that I, from what I can tell, is that he will be a Draymond at five that they don't feel guilty at five because that's really his role, and they, he's not a starter uh, probably at this point, probably ever. So I think he's already top among the Warriors' young bigs in the rotation. I think he's jumped Damian Jones. I think he's jumped Kevon Looney. Not a big feat to jump Kevon Looney. But I think he's there. And so then that means if anybody gets hurt, he'll jump into that role. And he's smart and he's unselfish. So I think Kerr might try to find spots for him. The problem with the Warriors is that it's three guys. If it was two, then maybe you could scale those back. But when it's three, you're already dealing with like 10 minutes a game for most of them. Like Zaza plays 15, 18 David West plays 10, JaVale plays 10, then you're pretty much there. I mean, you've got, still got those occasional McAdoo minutes for like when the other team is just basically, you know, torching the Warriors' pick and roll defense. And, and yeah, and, he'll, and, and Bell will get those. Center. And you can tell already that Kerr really likes him and that, that they can see something. And, and one of the most telling parts, because the Warriors have only played one preseason game so far, they'll play on Wednesday night, is Kerr made a deliberate decision to play Bell's first NBA minutes with the other four all-stars which is really interesting that that's what he wanted because I think that's the role that they're most intrigued by with him 
and that I think long term Bell might even fit in. He'll fit in more in those like, kind of like star heavy lineups than he will in more of the backup units because he doesn't take anything away from those other than you know that he's a different kind of limitations offensively. It, totally, and that's why I asked that question because I think from a not even that long term perspective, maybe like a two year window type perspective, he's the guy of basically all their backups or front court guys not named Draymond who seems like the biggest asset already to me. I mean, in terms of, you know, some of these guys are just going to wash out, you know, age wise. Uh, Some of them I haven't really seen much from. And then the center spot to me, it's still, I mean, they're, they're solid and set for this year, but you know, longer term past that, I'm not sure how much I love those guys. So it seems like if I was Kerr, I would be spoon feeding bell early, you know, to make sure he's feeling confident and comfortable and getting his reps with their stars, because that could be part of a, a longer term play. So a big question with a couple of these guys, not really the high-end ones, is going to be how do these teams handle them in terms of the G League? So will Jordan Bell, will Josh Hart, I'm not worried about this really with the Sun guys, especially now that Devon Reed is hurt. Will they- Thomas Bryant. Thomas Bryant. Like, will they be, will they be having those guys stay up with the main team and traveling with the team? Or are they going to be trying to get some more minutes down in the G League? And so how each of those teams handles it and is going to be worth watching because there are benefits and downsides to each one of those. I've heard some rookies that came up say that they really like traveling with the team, getting a sense of what it's really like to be an NBA player. But it's true that they're not getting the same kind of reps because, yes, yeah, scrimmages and practices are fine, though NBA teams don't practice that much during the season. But getting really getting game time with the G League team can be useful. And I think a lot of these teams have the setup where the G League team is really close, you know, at, at home. So that makes it easier, I think, to, you know, get get both of those things as opposed to really having to necessarily choose between them. I mean, certainly in terms of travel, it's it's still an issue. But, uh, you know, yeah, I think I mean, they can like, practice like you're saying, with the team and then go play a game, you know, the next night. Yeah, the Lakers are kind of in the same, you know, geographical area. The Suns are a G League team. So, yeah, it's pretty convenient for a couple of the teams here. Uh, yeah, I mean, pretty much all of them. I think Sacramento to Reno <laughs> is probably the farthest one, right? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> to late reaction. <laughs> Sorry, I was taking that too seriously. Speaking of the G League, who knows when he's going to get back on the court and whether he'll get any NBA minutes at all. But I, I am also intrigued to see Chris Boucher, the the Warriors yeah. two two way guy who uh, was Jordan Bell's teammate at Oregon last year, a stretch five who is a phenomenal shot blocker and also makes threes. Uh, tore his ACL last year in the Pac-12 tournament, so. You know, that's that's one reason he went undrafted along with the fact that I think he's like 25 already, but uh, a very intriguing still set nonetheless. Yeah, I'm a fan of his. I really liked him at, at Oregon and thought that him being hurt was really going to sidetrack them later, later on. And it didn't, which was impressive. Also, quick second to Oregon having like six or so NBA caliber players on their team last year. That's pretty awesome. Not a fan. Oh, <laughs> that's just your per- that's just your purple glasses, KP. It, it sure is. Yeah, hey, Kevin, aren't you a big Marquise Chris fan? I know he went to your favorite school. Well, why don't we get a nice little uh, verbal essay from you about what a phenomenal prospect he is? I, I was a little disappointed you don't, didn't go in harder on him uh, after our discussion on G-Chat last night. Yeah, I mean, Marquise Chris started playing basketball so late, like not until high school. And you definitely... Oh, he started? See. He started? <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, well, Ke- well, Kevin, you, you, the phrase you used with him, which I have blatantly stolen and use consistently now, is pattern recognition. Like that's yep. the biggest problem with him is just what I was always worried about with Amari Stoudemire, actually. And I'm not comparing those two guys ever, ever, except that they play on the same team. But that's the big problem with him is that he's not he doesn't have the reps for that, which is like the opposite of Lonzo Ball. And I don't know that he has the interest to really get there or the capacity to the capacity to turn all the stuff that he's getting now into like instincts. Yeah. And you definitely see the value of it because, I mean, from a physical standpoint, from a skill standpoint, it's all there. And it's really just the ability to read the game. And and I think that so much of that is about just reps and experience. And as late as he started, you may not be able to catch up. Yeah. I mean, he is the exact type of guy who is frustrating because just the athleticism to awareness ratio is is totally out of kilter. And you always just want to think like, man, if he could just do this or just do this, he could really be a player. Is um, he, so is he is, so I, I like to think of that as the Gerald Green scale. Is he past Gerald Green on the Gerald Green scale? He might be the scale. 
I mean, I, I'm, I struggle to think of guys who are sort of like more, like if you charted it, like if the X axis was awareness and the Y axis was athleticism, I think he would be like right up there in that corner all by himself. I don't know. I'm interested to hear other candidates on this one. Maybe that's something for the listeners uh, to weigh in on too, but he is way out there. Well, I mean, young JaVale McGee was up there too. For sure. I mean, current JaVale McGee might. <laughs> yeah. Anthony, <laughs> Anthony Randolph is high on that scale. It's a, I like that it's a lot of guys that I've covered. Um, yeah, there that that would be a fun thing. We can have listener input. That might actually be something that, that Nate and I do on Dunked On at some point. But yeah, I, I, I think that Chris is really frustrating for that. Oh, let's just quickly before we get off the topic. Who would be at the exact opposite of that scale of an NBA player? Is it Teodosic? Lonzo, actually. I mean, Lonzo's a great dunker, but, you know, the lateral quickness isn't there. And I, so much of his game is built on pattern recognition and the fact that he played it so much basketball in such a high speed for his dad under the, the way his dad wanted them to play that that's what really struck me watching him last year at UCLA. Is like the game never got too fast for him. And I don't think that's going to happen at the NBA level either. Yeah, I, I feel like you can already see him adjusting to NBA speed. I mean, just watching the preseason, like there's times where defensive, you know, hands and deflections are happening where he's not expecting them to. But I also fully trust his ability to adjust to that. Like, I don't think that's going to be a very long process for him. So in that way, I kind of like the, the Jason Kidd comparisons, to be honest. I mean, I pattern recognition or whatever you want to call it. I mean, I, but, I think he's got yeah, it. I think Lonzo is a better athlete than that. I think that's why he's not all the way at the scale because he has he has a little bit there. You know, he's, he the lateral quickness. Is, is a concern but I think as, he's a little bit underrated as a vertical guy like he can he can yep. get up there a little bit for rebounds and dunks and all that that's why I was kind of thinking Taya Dosic is because Taya Dosic doesn't have any he doesn't have any of that sort of the there isn't the theory of like oh Taya Dosic is an underrated athlete he's a physical capability because everything that he does just like people say oh Steph Curry's not a good athlete that's just he's good a different kind of good athlete but you know, you well, have your, to, well, your, your point basically is that he has the awareness to throw a full court underhanded pass while smoking a cigarette simultaneously. It's, it's pretty, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> pretty that, remarkable that, combination. That pass was was delightful, and yes, it is not the first time that's ever been thrown in an NBA game, and guys try to do that in in pickup sometimes. But I mean, but what's what's I love the thing that I've gotten really into with passing, and that both Tadosic and Lonzo were in, and LeBron is is one of the modern kings of this is varying and really good velocity on their passes like that throw by Tay Dosich was so shockingly fast for the angle it took like if it had been slower then it would have created problems and Lonzo Tay Dosich those guys are awesome at that yep so we're gonna have a super fast season preview but I don't think there's going to be much disagreement here so we can do it super fast first question is ranking these teams one to five presumably in terms of regular season record so, I mean, obviously the Warriors and Clippers are one and two. I, I think you could maybe get some debate over the last three teams and the last two in particular, but uh, I'm going to go Lakers, Kings, Suns. I have the same one to five. Originally, when I talked to KP last week, I had the Clippers out of the playoffs. Uh, I think I'm I'm ready to put them back in, although I hate myself for saying that. But are so are you the same Lakers King Suns for the bottom three? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think I'm going to go Lakers King Suns as well. The biggest part of it being that the Lakers have no incentive to tank. You know, even though there is crazy protection with their pick, it does not involve them at all. Whereas Sacramento, you know, once once they hit the stop sign, they will embrace the stop sign, and the Suns are basically already there, so that's not going to be a problem for them. And then the second question, which again is probably pretty easy for this division, is how many teams make the playoffs? Yeah, I mean, it really just comes down to whether the, you think the Clippers are going to make the playoffs I, I i think it would be uh there's, there's not a reasonable case to be made for any of the bottom three teams making it and there's definitely not a reasonable case to be made for the warriors making it so i, I do like the clippers so i'm gonna go too to begrudgingly like i just said yeah yeah, yeah i meant like i, 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 I meant could one, see one yeah one point seven likely scenario is one or the second most likely scenario is just one yeah second most likely scenario is definitely one so KP, would you like? I'm thinking about like a 75, 60 percent chance, something in that range, that the Clippers make the playoffs. Does that seem about right? Yeah, that seems reasonable. I did some simulations the other day. Let me see if I can pull those up and and see what what percentage of simulations they made the playoffs in with their pretty optimistic RPM projection. I I guess that might be closer to 85. Yeah. So so then if you scale that back, because I'm lower on them than the RPM, I think that would be about in the range that I'm thinking. And it's also weird, kind of with the with the West, that the the playoff teams are so the playoff caliber teams are so good that it's going to be so hard for the teams that are not in that group to make their way up and this is i've thought about this when we did dallas it's like yeah like there's a pathway that dallas could win 
38, 40 games, but I don't really see a realistic path that 40 wins, 42 wins get you in. So the 1,000 simulations I ran, the Warriors obviously made it 1,000. The Clippers, 86.3%. The uh, the Lakers twenty times two percent and the Kings and Suns twice in one time respectively. A thousand out of a thousand for the Warriors. How often does that happen? It's not that uncommon. Uh, nobody in the East quite got to a thousand out of a thousand. Cleveland did they was still ever, only ninety nine point five. Did they ever not win the division? Because that would be like I tried to figure out somebody. Because when I I did over unders with Arturo Galetti and we were talking about the Warriors division odds and the odds are so low that it's basically like you could just keep the money in the bank and get interest on it. And I it, it is I mean theoretically possible, but I don't see a realistic because like even if the Clippers win fifty five, which would be a wonderful season for them, uh, nine times out of a thousand they did not win the pl- the division. <laughs> nice. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, that, maybe they just like protested or something like there's yeah. some political protest where the starters. Yeah, they all they all took it. They, they all took a knee and, and Commissioner Silver su- suspended them for five games each. And so they lost those five games. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this over under on 67. Danny, Kevin said under. I over. said over over. I, I'm not I'm not like soul like I wouldn't put money on it. But I think that because 68 wins is a ton, you know, 68 is a ton. But this is, you know, this to me is the best regular season team on paper of any of these Warriors teams. And we'll have to see if that actually works out. But they're deeper and the way that they're approaching this. And, and also the other big part of this is adding the more rest will really help them because they can go through this in a different way. And yeah, I mean, I think I think it's going to be ridiculous. I, I think they're, you know, I don't know what the odds are of them going over 70, but I wouldn't be surprised at all if they went over 70 this year. I think 70 is in sight, oh. too. Yeah, oh, okay. I don't think you can be surprised by it. But before we move, oh, you're on, you're betting against it, KP. Yeah, no. but that doesn't mean I'm going to be surprised by it. All but right. before so. we move on to breakout players, which we'll do briefly, the, I last year at around this time, I said on a I said on actually on a fantasy basketball podcast that the Warriors were going to lose five or fewer games in the playoffs, and that ended up being a lot fewer. It was one. Where would you guys put that number right now in terms of how many games you? Because this is a very different landscape than it was a year ago. That's a belt where I'd put the line. I mean, I can see, you know, semifinals, conference finals, finals, they drop, you know, two games apiece in those series, which would be six. Um, so, yeah, I, I think five is a reasonable over under for them. Wait, who are they losing two games in the semifinals to? Okay, Well, see. if they face Oklahoma City, yeah. No, come on. I don't think they're losing a single game to Oklahoma City in a series. I think that's a sweep. Really? Yeah, I, I feel pretty good about so that. So you set one. the line at like four, then maybe four and a half. I'd say I'd say four and a half. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think San Antonio c- could still throw them for a loop. I think Houston's definitely a better playoff matchup than they have been in the past. And you know, as we're seeing, like their offensive ceiling, which was already ridiculous, is definitely higher this year. Uh, and then there's the LeBron factor, where he's always good for at least one. So I'd say four and a half's the line. So KP, would you take the over on four and a half? I would take a slight over on that, yeah. Yeah, that's uh, that's a that's a close call. I I think I'd probably I think I'd probably go over that, but I feel like I'm going to be made a fool of at some point. But that's fine. So last question: What players in this division? There are a lot of options here. It doesn't have to be becoming superstars. Do you think are going to break out or going to have a really nice year? Nick Young. <laughs> <laughs> Turning the whole conversation on its head. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> um, I. I don't know if he's actually going to break out, but I feel like KCP may be perceived to break out because I think he'll probably have a little bit more opportunity to play to do things offensively. And I, I just love the fit with him and Lonzo. Yeah, for me, for me, this is a division where I think that along the KCP lines where people are either going to be reminded or learn that players are good where, where, as opposed to a breakout. So like Eric Bledsoe, you know, I, I think people have forgotten that Eric Bledsoe is a very, very good basketball player and that that can happen. I think that's more a possibility than like somebody really taking a step just because of the way these teams are structured. And the same could be true for Gallo and Blake Griffin, too. I was going to say Blake Griffin right on that same line of what you just said about Bledsoe. Is he's still really awesome, and he's now in a bigger role than he's probably been in since very, very early in his career, and he's a much better player than he was at that stage. Can he stay healthy? But he's certainly in line to remind people of, of what he's been just because he, he's always missed the playoff showcase. You know, I mean, that's been a, a persistent problem for him, and I think he's really fallen off the radar for people. Yeah, I think the, the Phoenix Tain has definitely kind of rubbed off onto people's Bledsoe, you know, perception. Uh, I would love to see him traded to kind of reestablish who he is as a player. And I think KP is a little too hard on Ingram. You know, I think I don't know if he's going to have some gigantic breakthrough season, but I think 
he is going to be a much better player than he was last year, which isn't saying a ton. But I think he's going to be kind of in that track, you know, where we're starting to say like, oh, OK, this guy could be a, a real player here. He's he's making substantial progress. I mean, I think that Ingram and Booker are both in the category where they could break out to the extent that they improve into what people already think they are. Like Andrew yeah. Wiggins? Yeah, it, it's been mentioned earlier about Booker. Yeah, I think that that's a good way of thinking about it. The two other things I want to mention, one is Scal. I'm morally obligated to mention Scal. I, th- I still think he's <laughs> going to be awesome. And then the other one is the, the welcome return of consistently fun Pacific time zone basketball. Because whether a lot of these teams win games or lose games, we're going to see a lot of fun stuff starting at 7 and 7.30 this year. Because the Lakers are, you know, they're one of those you know, have fun with they're like, they're going to make almost every team fun. That's going to be great. And then the Clippers are similar. Like the, I mean, their games against Toronto, even though those were kind of train wrecks, were just a blast. The Warriors are their own thing. And even though they're not in this division, Portland is, is, is going to be interesting as well. Yeah. When I talked about how, how much the Lakers uh, being good was like going to improve my viewing experience as a West coast league pass watcher, got a lot of complaints from East coast fans about do, really you needed more. <laughs> but I mean, yeah. the, the thing about that is like the last year, West Coast basketball wasn't that interesting because like the Warriors were just I mean, their games were interesting for like a couple of quarters and they're just beating the stuffing out of people. And and a lot of their best games were actually on the road. So that, so that was a factor. No, I'm with you. I'd rather watch Lonzo than Cousins temper tantrums. And that was one of the best things to watch early last season. in those late games is just sort of like what's going to crazy things going to happen in Sacramento. And, and now we have a more intrigue. Hey, one other super high class first world breakout camp candidate who I think we should mention I think Steph's gonna have a better year this year than last year and I think we could get more magic Steph like we had two years ago there's not the KD thing where they're balancing and he's trying to like you know seed some of the spotlight he's got the contract so that's all done they got their revenge I mean all any of the storylines or pressure or any of that stuff I think is going to be subsiding and I think Steph just kind of had a down shooting year for him last year and I wouldn't be surprised at all if there was like a, a one of these, you know, reintroducing himself type seasons like we were mentioning for for Griffin and, and Bledsoe. But obviously on the MVP type level that we're talking about with Steph. I agree with everything you said, but I think when you are the unanimous MVP of the league, you forfeit your right to ever be considered a breakout player again. No, I and, know. And, but unless you like you know have, unless mean. you like have micro fracture surgery or something. But, but you, know, you know what I mean, though? He, he I do. probably but, didn't yeah, get enough so, attention so, last year. Yeah, the way that the way that I would there are two elements of Steph that I would put in here. One is my expectation for him is something like the 2014-15 MVP season, so not the unanimous one, but the one where he was competing with Harden until pretty much the last week of the season, that sort of a thing. And also, remember, this is something that I've become much more cognizant of in the last few years. Players that have to deal with an injury for a large portion of, a, of an offseason generally have that sort of a lull. And that's what Steph had last year because he was still, you know, as much as he wants to claim, you know, he, he's not going to use the MCL as an excuse for the 2016 finals. He wasn't right. And we're going to see that with a couple of guys this year that they had a real healthy off season and that that could that could really help. Well, we've we've gone on in some in some pretty fun depth here. Uh, is there anything else that you guys feel like we're we're thinking about these five teams that it should be a part of the story that w- needs to be a part of this podcast? Is it bad that we never mentioned Bogdan Bogdanovich one time in this I entire did. podcast? I did. Okay. Yeah, no, I was going to say there is nothing left to mention because between the two of you, you mentioned every roster player and two way contract players. So we're in great shape. <laughs> we didn't get into Ale- my guy, Alec Peters at all. So, you know, we got to save that for the sequel. <laughs> I even dropped Devon Reed and he's out for like months. That is but, true. But so you guys, other- you guys did a NBA 2K create a player named with Cinderius Thornwell. That was pretty impressive. <laughs> I like Cinderella I mean, Troy, Troy Daniels edition. We didn't talk about Jawan. We didn't talk about Jawan Evans. No. Nope. Yeah, Jawan Evans is there. Oh, and then so the other thing that I want to mention is I think the looming the looming sep- like specter of this entire season is the Lakers and really what they look like and whether they can get two max guys and that you know other than the title and all that kind of stuff that's going to be one of the big things I watch this year. Yep. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the Lakers could be back. Yeah. Well, thank you guys so much for taking the time. A pleasure as always. Thanks, Danny. LeBron to San Antonio, not LA. Thanks again to Kevin Pelton and Ben Golver for taking the time to come on. You can 
Read Kevin's work, does great stuff at ESPN Insider primarily, and he, I really enjoyed his, uh, he did a really good appearance on The Jump with Mark Spears and Jorge Zano talking about the NBA and politics. If you haven't seen it, I would definitely recommend that. You can follow him on Twitter, at K Pelton, K-P-E-L-T-O-N. Ben Golver, of course, writes for Sports Illustrated, and you can follow him on Twitter, at Ben Golliver, B-E-N-G-O-L-L-I-V-E-R. And that's the end of the of the capsule things. It's good because the season is about to start. So there isn't that much left to do in that. Going to try to figure out exactly what I want to do next week, especially with Dunked On. We're going to do a full on season preview, awards predictions and all that. And I've, I've tried to become more cognizant of keeping these things a little bit different. So like my plan is I'm not going to do you know, a, a rookie extension deadline analysis here like I've done with Dan Feldman the last couple of years because Nate and I do that right away. And so don't need to be as superfluous now. That is the tentative plan. If you have a disagreement with that, let me know. I'll tell you about feedback in a little bit. But working on on getting a good guess for that and, of course, be integrating a lot of other stuff. Hope to keep doing prospect analysis and everything like that. And I'm actually probably going to try to watch more college this year than I have before. So I'm very excited about that. And it's going to be a fun year. Not all the way to it yet, watching the preseason, actually recording this outro at halftime of the late Warriors Wolves game, which is in Shenzhen, China. So that's always going to be exciting and see where the season goes. Talked a little bit about that with with Ben and with Kevin. I want to take a quick second to extend my well wishes and condolences to the people of Vegas for what happened this week. I'm not going to get into the politics of it all, but people lose sight of that Vegas is a very important basketball city, even though they don't have an NBA team both in the NBA level from Summer League to Team USA, but also in the AAU circuit and college and and everything like that. So they do have a really meaningful connection. I've spent more time there due to basketball and it made it more personal for me in that way, though, of course, that loss of life is important anywhere. So my heart goes out to all of those people. And of course, still Puerto Rico and all of the other people with everything that's been going on this summer and fall. So that's enough of the kind of the down part of it, but very excited for where this season is going. If you want to support this podcast, there are a lot of different ways you can do it. You can leave a rating, leave a review in the podcast player of your choosing. You can also subscribe, download every episode, which is important with this show because they come out at weird times, including one in the morning Pacific time. That happens. And also spreading it by word of mouth, telling people you like it. There are people who really don't know, even if they follow me or whatever, that the show exists. You can spread the word however you see fit. Really do appreciate that. And of course, checking out our sponsors. Greats, G-R-E-A-T-S dot com. Awesome shoe purveyor. I really do love the ones that I have, the Royales with Nero, but you'll find something you like there. They have a lot of different styles. And and again, the promo code is RealGM, R-E-A-L-G-M, 15% off and free exchanges, free returns. So you can definitely check it out and you'll find something you like. I, I was very impressed with it and I've worn them a lot and really, really like them, not only stylistically, but in comfort. And of course, those things both matter an absolute ton. On a personal, non-Real GM level, some cool stuff going on. I will be writing more regularly for Real GM this year, which is very exciting. Going to be doing a little bit more for them beyond the CBA encyclopedia. And then, of course, I'll have a lot of CBA work, including for The Athletic and hopefully for the Sporting News. And we'll see who else, if, if anybody else is willing to do it. But I think with them and, then of course, Warriors work with The Athletic and my book. I actually just received my first physical copy of it today. It was very exciting. It was you know, it's It's one of those things that's hard to convey just because so much went into it. And it's 100 Things Warriors fans should know and do before they die. It is Warrior-centric, but it's a it's a cool way to support me. And I th- think it's a, it, it's a lot of stories that, are, that should be interesting to the broader NBA, though they are all, of course, about the Warriors in some way, shape, or form. So you can check that out. It's on booksellers everywhere, really. I mean, especially online, but local places should have it to a degree as well. And you can also, I'm, I'm working on still, I'm probably going to like sign and mail copies for people who want that, but I'm still figuring out payment and mailing and all that. I'm learning a lot about this process. So if you have any feedback on the show, good, bad, or indifferent, Danny LaRue NBA at gmail.com at Danny LaRue on Twitter. Email is way better because you can actually take your time and, and I won't miss it. And if you take the time to write it, I will take the time to read it. I don't promise I'll respond because that gets complicated, but I do promise that I will read what you write. So thanks again for listening. Take care and make it a great day.